Let's, uh, let's start. Uh, so, uh, so first of all, thank you very much uh, for, for coming to this session. Uh, my name is Sebastian Seidel. I'm the founder of Scalar. Uh, and it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, to all of you uh, Jonathan Chang that you saw at the keynote yesterday. Um, he's the chief engineer at uh, NASA JPL. And he's going to be talking about the, uh, the, uh, the hybrid cloud that they've build, been building, the architecture, design decisions, and all that. So first of all, perhaps you can talk about the, uh, the JPL. And, uh, and then we can get started. So yeah, um, you know, at JPL we like to brag, so I'm going to talk a little bit about our missions and try not to be completely so repetitive. We just, we just can we get oh, the I just lost back the on? slides. Hey. All right. All right. So Sebastian went through this part. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about JPL. We we manage and maintain a lot of missions. You guys might have seen the keynote yesterday. Um, in 2012, we landed the Curiosity rover on the surface of Mars. And it has uh, been a significant uh, accomplishment for JPL in that we've uh, found traces of, of life uh, from millions of years ago on the surface of Mars. Um, our upcoming Europa Clipper mission, uh, we believe under the uh, icy surface, the icy crust of the moon of Europa that orbits Jupiter, there is uh, liquid water which can sustain and host life. We find that on Earth, where wherever we found water in, in favorable or unfavorable conditions, We've always found microbial life. So, uh, this is uh, the surface water ocean topography. One of these, this mission is going to launch in 2020, but this represents a, a, a significant change for JPL. This mission can downlink 40 terabytes of ap synthetic aperture radar data on a daily basis. And that's level zero raw data, would, when processed, will grow exponentially. So, we have a very significant data volume problem at JPL that we're trying to address. This is the Mars 2020 rover and, an, and a representation of, of the various instruments that are going to be carried. This is really essentially a reboot of the Curiosity rover with, with different kind of science. Right? So that's going to launch in 2020. Why 2020? Well, every two years we have a window where, where, where Mars and Earth have conjunctions. We can very easily get to Mars in, in eight months versus you know, getting gravitational assist and then doing all that stuff. Um, and we, we can't do any of this without the Deep Space Network, which is our pipeline into our various uh, deep space exploration vehicles. Um, as you guys might know, uh, Voyager has actually left our solar system and is in interstellar space that was launched in the 70s. We're still receiving data from that today. So the good stuff. Um, all these missions are, are quite unique. Everyone has a specific workload. And they all have different requirements. In fact, you can almost say that we need a cloud for every one of these projects. So synthetic aperture radar is a different workload than, let's say, a deep space mission that's bringing back images and things like that. So for us, hybrid is, 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 is kind of almost like a bespoke or boutique kind of a model for us. So some clouds are really good for doing specific things, and, and some clouds aren't. Um, for example, we moved the entire Mars public outreach website back in 2012. Uh, to Amazon to accommodate the huge amount of, of um, public interest. Uh, we did, we used you know services like CloudFront and S3 uh, uh, to really serve out um, the video stream and the image repositories for all of the raw images that are coming from the Curiosity rover. They're there today, um, and you can actually reference them you know just using the uh, HTTP endpoints. So people have built mosaics based on the images we host there. People have built their own websites. Talk a little bit about the uh, the Reddit inc incidents. Oh yeah, so so we got front page on Reddit for uh, uh, <laughs> interesting <laughs> enough for for our one of our opportunity rovers drawing a phallic symbol on the surface of Mars, and it was so popular it actually broke some of our websites. <laughs> okay. Um, so each workload really translates to an uh, ideal home. As we talked about, the pu public cloud is fantastic, right? We 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 want to rent for the spike. We can, we can predict, you know, at, at let's say 40 terabytes of downlink, how much forward processing we require to keep up with that 40 te terabytes, to, to take that level zero into level one data product. Um, but what we can't do is measure how many times we want to reprocess that data. So a scientist can come to us and go, hey, man, we've got a, a whole different algorithm. We want to find out something different. We want to take the entire data set, the multi-petabyte data set, and we want to reprocess the whole thing based on this new algorithm that we've, do, we've come up with. So how do you buy that? What do you go out and run to the data center and go, yeah, in, in three weeks, these guys actually want to reprocess two petabytes of data. 
So let's go stand up some servers. No, that's not the right model for us. We actually want to rent for the spike. So we've been using Azure and Amazon for that. So, so forward processing, keep up in-house, and then all the elasticity out, out in the cloud. And, um, so so you're, you're mentioning here as well that, uh, that the you know, bandwidth of some instruments is a big, big constraint. That's one of the, one of the primary reasons for using, uh, for using OpenStack, right? Right. So, um, so uh, my straight man over here. <laughs> uh, not, not only um, um, data locality and data movement are challenges, but also um, compliance, right? So we, we are required to, to comply with the international trade and arms regulations, which essentially says that US persons only physical and logical access to our data, right? So easier to, for us to do it in-house. Um, and, and some of the clouds are catching up with those kind of compliance things. Uh, they're not all quite there yet. Uh, so for us, our hybrid cloud today is Amazon, Azure, and our on-prem OpenStack. Um, to mention our on-prem OpenStack, we've been using Nebula, and we still are, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> but the, we, we, we have some, we, we, we had a plan B early on, and, and with some help from some vendors and sitting in the room, we, we, we were able to deploy a secondary cloud that we're working towards operationalizing. So. Um, so hybrid cloud is very challenging. Uh, it introduces a lot of things like diverse APIs, right? Um, multiple identities for each of the clouds. Uh, obvious security concerns for us with compliance and with uh, um, you know ITAR regulations and and governance um, um, and, and software du duplication. Right? Oh boy, that's that didn't come out right. <laughs> Sorry. So we looked for help uh, tooling with portability, the ability to um, reuse our work and move our work across multiple clouds. And we needed automated tagging, and, and along with autom automated tagging, the, the chargeback showback system, right? So for us, tagging is, is, is really important because in shared cloud accounts, tags are really essential to understand the accountability, right? And for example, in Amazon, you, you can, you, you, you can enforce, you can't enforce tags and they're not automated, right? So you can have a policy that says whatever you spin up, you need to tag, but it, it's really hard to enforce that except by somebody knocking on your door and saying, hey, you haven't tagged your instances. So we need some kind of uh, automation that'll help us with the governance of that. And because uh, uh, tags are essential for us to do chargeback, and we're a full cost accounting organization, we charge you back for everything from your phone to your laptop to your network port to everything. So everything at JPL, uh, is a chargeback service. Uh, tags are really, really integrate, uh, integral to, to doing chargeback and showback. Um, and, and license tracking, understanding the usage and budgets for operating system licensing costs in, in various clouds. And uh, definitely self-service, um, a common API layer we're looking for to abstract those diverse cloud APIs. And, and, and JPL is really concerned um, with vendor lock-in. We are actually forced to compete all of our contracts for software for vendors of various things like that. We actually just went through a, an entire RFP for our entire cloud um, uh, contracts. So that's in process right now. That's good because that's our uh, taxpayer money, right? <laughs> right. We can't favor any one single vendor. Yeah. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the, uh, a little bit more about the portability aspects of the ch choice of Amazon Azure and for the well, public clouds? Right now, um, so, so Amazon, as public cloud for us, uh, two reasons. Why. One is they have an ITAR compliant region called GovCloud. Mm -hmm. So we, we can leverage that and we can, we can use our, uh, our um, uh, we can put our ITAR workloads in, in GovCloud. And um, Azure we've used since ooh, about six or seven years ago uh, as a PaaS. We built our Be a Martian public outreach websites there. But we're not super deep into Azure yet. They don't have that ITAR compliance for us today. Okay, so making hybrid cloud work, and we, we, we found Scalar, and here's kind of the architecture. Um, uh, we really wanted to introduce a modular approach into our decisions into building a hybrid cloud, right? So we needed, on, on the very left, the red part, we needed a cloud management platform, something that will help us uh, abstract those, those various APIs and those, those uh, identities and, and accesses. Um, so we looked at a lot of things, and I won't name the things we saw, but we got sticker shock from a lot of uh, <laughs> the ones we saw. And what really attracted us to Scalar was the fact that it was open source. They upstream all their code. Um, and you know, I, I, I'm gun shy about small companies after Nebula, 
but the fact that they do contribute all their code to the open source gives me a little bit of a, a, a confidence. Um, the second module underneath that is all the various clouds. And, and, and I think we got a, 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 a nice surprise when Amazon on April, I'm, I'm sorry, Nebula on April Fool's Day said they were shutting their doors. But because you know, there's a different abstraction layer, we still could offer our users, because of the abstraction layer for, for Scalar, Amazon instead or Azure instead. Right? So we can keep our cloud infrastructure going, even though our Nebula infrastructure is no longer supported. And then we can introduce new vendors or new clouds uh, very easily because that abstraction layer exists. Can you talk a little bit about SaltStack and, um, and the different applications? Yeah, so the final layer um, is, is kind of an automation layer. We use Salt. We also use Chef and Puppet. But um, what we found is, is we like to create uh, so, so, so cloud is infrastructure as a service, essentially. right? And you're going to give people uh, API and, and console access to build uh, infrastructure. But at the same time, they need to do things um, for us, like the, we need to meet NIST controls for every single one of our instances that are running. Um, so things like your message of the day, the NASA warning banner, uh, uh, password length and expiration, uh, the list goes on and on. Uh, NIST 853 kind of uh, describes all the things we need to do to a server before it is compliant, right? So in the past, you would launch a server and you'd start installing packages and password uh, expiration lengths. But what we've done with Salt is we've created um, all those protective measures that we need to meet NIST in a salt configuration. And on, um, on instance launch, you can pass user data to go to uh, the salt repository, install the salt agent, and then in 15 minutes, all the protective measures are, are worked into each of our instances. Um, so that's, that's the automation layer. We've also created uh, an API for things like uh, DNS, uh, LDAP, uh, what else? our chargeback system. So that when that instance comes up, it can immediately register in our chargeback system, get a host name, and then add all the LDAP users from the group. So that's kind of the automation layer we're talking about. So uh, really, the model is to provide services for service providers. We know that application developers are building application platforms for our end users. So if we can simplify all those um, lower end kind of uh, heavy lifting kind of things, like doing protective measures and, and registering in LDAP and DNS, if we can do all those things for them, we can simplify and accelerate their, their process. So that's kind of our modular approach. So, so how so, scalar helps? <laughs> so I'll, I'll, t I'll, I'll take over a little bit. Um, all, all right, so, so we were talking about a little bit of, uh, about the problems that, um, uh, that you know, making hybrid cloud work is, is fairly difficult. Um, so, so just as a little bit of a background, Scale is a control plane and an abstraction layer over multiple clouds and gives, uh, gives JPL a lot of policies to be able to do all the compliance and, and all of that. So um, one, of the, uh, one of the big, uh, big things that Jonathan was talking about is, is portability of an application from, say, OpenStack to, uh, to Amazon for, say, things like cloud bursting. Uh, some of the uh, some of the experiments that they're, they're doing is are uh, are HPC and embarrassingly parallel, and when they want to do one of their radiation simulations, for example, they need to be able to burst out from their OpenStack to the public cloud or, or vice versa. So the combination of using Salt for configuration and uh, a, a scalar has an abstraction uh, object called uh, Role. It's kind of an abstraction over on top of different clouds. Um, that that allows them to to get a, a lot of portability. I don't want to. Uh, do you want to add anything on the cloud bursting side? Um, you know, so the the, the the idea is um, sc what Scalar really is letting us do is is imagine. Um, you know, if you're a scientist and you need to do, let's say, radiation simulation on a specific instrument, and you you need to do a lot of it, right? What we can do with Scalar is, you know, instead of uh, traditionally that scientist going out and buying a large supercomputer and clustering it, uh, what we did for using Scalar is, is we created a instance that had the the uh, software. It's called Jant4 already pre-compiled, right? And then we put an auto scaling threshold. And we let that user run, and it would just span, 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 provision, 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 burst into Amazon, and then deprovision. Um, and that user got a uh, 10 to the 11th number of of, uh, uh, of uh, radiation simulations of electrons, yeah, 100 billion, um, uh, done in a relatively sh uh, small amount of time. So, yeah. the the idea is really building out platform services that that you traditionally your 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 users would have you know, gone out and built a, a, a multi-tier application for, but you can package all those in, into a scalar farm using roles, and then use the scalar API to deploy the entire package. Right. So, 
Hello. Yeah, um, and, and uh, harking back to the uh, to the um, the architecture slide, because uh, all all the scientists go through the the scalar control plane, scalar can ensure that everything's properly tagged with a line like experiment line of business, uh, the user, whether it's production development or any of those things that, that allow to do the the showback and then ingestion into the um, into the financial systems. So uh, so tagging governance allows you to like automatically tag stuff. Um, there's uh, one, one of the things that, that Jonathan was really really likes is the unattended restarts. Um, so Scalar has a desired state engine, the same as you would you would get from heat or uh, or cloud formation, uh, with the you know, desired state, observed state, and, and reconciliation object. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about the unattended restarts and yeah, how that's so, valuable? Yeah, so uh, a Scalar provisioned instance could be like let's say a web application, and if we just put a, the the, the auto scaling threshold to one, if it's terminated by Amazon or by anybody else, it just uh, automatically mm -hmm. re-kicks off the instance from the farm that was deployed from. Um, then th there's also the uh, b um, auto scaler or, or the cloud bursting uh, aspect, uh, basically w for the radiation simulation clusters, being able to uh, to you know, run a certain workload uh, across clouds, uh, irregardless of, of where they are. Yeah, I, I think I think um, as, as far as the abstraction layer, ultimately what we're leveraging the scaler for is is if we can start pushing the users up the stack where they're not thinking about the cloud or the infrastructure that any of this stuff is running on, then we can, we can actually switch all those things out or, or put them in the right cloud or, or based on cost, you know, based on competition of cost versus, you know, we can say we can put it on our OpenStack cloud because that's the lowest cost or we can put it in Amazon because we're going to save some licensing costs uh, or the complexity of managing an enterprise licensing agreement through Microsoft or Red Hat or something like that. Uh, so we can do a combination of all these things. You can have a multi-tier application that maybe the Windows portion runs in, in Amazon and maybe the Linux portion runs at home. And, and, and that's what Scalar really does that abstraction from. Right. Yeah. Um, then there's also uh, so resource reclamation. Uh, currently, uh, uh, is something that that's in the works at, um, at, at JPL, um, but uh, but not currently, not cur still not currently used. Um, basically, the idea here is that uh, when you allow big self-service across a, a, a large fleet, uh, from uh, when you have a lot of developers that are just going to the cloud pro provisioning their own things, what you have is over time you you have. Um, larger amount of orphan servers, stuff that's left running and just accrues cost. So resource reclamation and garbage collection is important. And uh, we're, we're working to, to add that. Um, uh, we talked about uh, um, basically being able to, to show back different costs and ingest that into the, the financial systems. So the cost analytics capability of Scalar isn't perfect, uh, but and no knock on Scalar, but, but it's good enough now to give our users a ballpark of what their total costs are. There are some overhead costs yeah. and things that Scalar cannot track, yeah. but it gives you a really 80% uh, of the way kind of cost analytics, right? So we can give that to the individual user and they can see, anticipate, you know, maybe 20% or 30% more uh, wh whatever the cost analytics are giving them now. So. Yeah, uh, and, and, and to that effect, there's actually some, some really good solutions out there like Cloudin, if you're familiar with that, um, that, that you can plug into to for... Uh, uh, for, for more control over the cost layer. Um, yeah, and, and then we've, we've hashed the, uh, the API, like the, the high-level API over, over multiple clouds. So we've kind of hashed that multiple times already. Um, all right, and, and the, uh, the last thing that Jonathan was talking about is license tracking. And then you know, through a combination of, of webhooks uh, into the, 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 their CMDB, you can track at all times how many licenses are being uh, used in the system so that you can, uh, if you're approaching maximum, you can start doing, uh, you know, taking action on that. Um, yeah, and the, the very last thing, maybe you want to talk about, talk about the self-service portal and how you want to, you're a service provider to... Um right, so we, we, I, I talked about, uh, you know, very quickly, and I apologize for, you know, <laughs> going so fast, but um, we, we talked a little bit about abstracting the underlying kind of, you know, data center, or hypervisor, or cloud uh, from users. Um, and what we've really leveraged Scalar, do, we, we realized after using Scalar for a year, and no knock on Scalar, but it... Uh, you know, it, it, it takes a little bit of training to understand yeah. the full capabilities of, of Scalar. You don't give somebody a Scalar interface and they go, wow, I'm ready to go. Um, it, it takes a little bit. Uh, but, but we realize that the, the, the abstraction API is very powerful and we can leverage that abstraction API and front end it to a portal or a catalog or, or even a very simple catalog uh, to actually provision, let's say, a multi-tier application, a web service, right, based on instead of um, cost, but, but based on like a service level, 
right? So if I wanted seven nines of availability, I can have a scalar farm that deploys a load balancer uh, and, and instances in multiple regions, either private or, or public, uh, and have a database that's replicated across multiple clouds. Right? And, and that's a single API call, because I've already created the roles, you know, MySQL, LAMP, whatever. Uh, and then I've uh, I, I created the farm, which is a single API call. And now, so we've done that. Um, our first, uh, our first um, project in doing that was uh, Europa's model-based system engineering environment. So Europa Clipper mission is in uh, design stage right now. Uh, so we have a, a large number of system engineers that want to do model-based system engineering. Uh, so we have a proprietary stack of, of tools that include you know, um, Magic Draw, which is a third-party tool, all of our, uh, our, our, our own proprietary tools that take that model-based system into you know, a, a more traditional framework uh, of requirements. And, and we can do that right now through a catalog that they make one single call and that engineer will get that system in the next in a few minutes. It goes back to LDAP, registers their host name. It does all of the protective measures. So that, that whole kind of uh, infrastructure is, is um, it, it's multi-tier, it's modular, but it's needed in order to kind of accelerate these users. You can't just think about, oh, well, now I've got an instance. But that instance for us needs to comply with, you know, like we said, NIST 800-53, uh, all of our internal uh, requirements, and all of that. Cool. <laughs> um, all right, so, so um, can you talk a little bit about the, uh, the different workloads that you're, th th that you're deploying? And yeah, so I jumped the gun. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Model-based system engineering, we Wait, talked about. Switch, uh, um, we, we even talked about the web hosting environments. So w we're building these kind of you know, web, uh, web application clusters based on availability instead of price, right? So uh, you know, in the back end, it could be a bunch of like micro instances right, that have scalar auto-scaling um, um, thresholds. Uh, they can be all internal. They can be. They can span multiple uh, clouds, and and for scientific uh, computing, we talked about the model where the scientist just tells us what libraries and what software they need, and we pre-configure them into Scalar, give it an auto-scaling threshold, and give them uh, something like SaltStack so they can pass the parameters that they need in each of those instances as they scale. Um, and that's where we are. Yeah. Um, so at, at this point. Um, um, yeah. Uh, so at this point, uh, we, we've we've reserved a very large block of time for, for to take questions for uh, questions for the uh, for the audience. Um, yeah. So uh, at, at this point, if you just raise your hand, uh, we'll be. Uh, uh, yeah. First question. So I have a question for you. Um, you have three different clouds and lots of data. So how do you get the VM and the data to be near each other to do this processing? Do you copy it, or do they all? go to a common source? So that's what one of our biggest challenges right now is, is these future missions are going to downlink more data than we can possibly, well, we can either do one of two things. We can build a really big pipe from where the data is downlinked back to JPL so we can do the processing at JPL, or we can just move the processing over there. So that's why OpenStack is kind of important for us, because now we can take, we can lease a facility very close to our downlink center, or our archive center, and start building out an infrastructure there. That's similar to what they have at home. So the portability of doing that, right? So th that's what we're really facing today. We're looking at, look, well, right now we have pipes from, from the data archive in Goddard back to JPL. And they're not huge pipes, but they cost a significant amount of money. If we can eliminate those specifically for the amount of data sets we're looking at in the near future, that would be ideal. I hope that answered your question. Thank you. Thank you. Great question. I was curious if you have your developers and users are interested in containers uh, as kind of a, a higher level abstraction, or if you see VMs being sufficient for the yeah, foreseeable yeah. future. So we're, we're, we, we are exploring containers. Now, you have to realize that NASA JPL is kind of a slow, we're, we're not trying to be innovative in IT. We're just trying to be you know, practical users or smart users of IT. Uh, so we are experimenting with containers specifically in our web hosting applications where we can create microservices out of, let's say, the MySQL uh, and, and you know, your Apache server and, and, and your load balancer, your Nginx, or whatever. And, and you know, in, in some sense, Scalar kind of treats those things uh, as roles. So your microservices can be roles inside a scaler. And at some point, I think you know when you guys do some integration, your 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 role could be a container, right? I think you guys are working on that. Now. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Um, I have a couple of questions. Please. Uh, one on performance. Uh, so for HPC, uh, obviously performance is important. Uh, so do you uh, have any uh, preference for bare metal? 
as against virtual servers? Well, yeah, and gonna, uh, how do you, uh, how do you address that? Some, you know, latency uh, through, the, through the hypervisor and the virtualization layer. If you're looking for a quantitative number, it varies, right? It, it depends on the type of virtualization you're running on. Um, we do see a performance degradation, but you have this kind of concept of elasticity, right? You can just keep spanning out yes. until you, you know, horizontally, until you, you know, you just buy more nodes, right? Or you, so, from, so your HPC users are just fine with virtual servers? Not, not, you know, if you need high, you know, interconnects, no. It's, you know, cloud isn't going to solve that for you. Not, right? not interconnect, uh, but raw performance. Uh, on bare metal, you get raw performance better than on virtual yeah, well, servers. Yeah, yeah. We, we find that bare metal is, is better performing mm -hmm. than, than virtualization, but you don't get the elasticity and the scalability of, of, of cloud when you're running on okay. just so, straight. So you metal. went on your private cloud, uh, you're not looking at bare metal uh, possibilities? We are, we are, we are. We're very interested in ironic. Okay. Okay. And the uh, second question is about security. Uh -huh. uh, so what are your security needs when you go to public cloud, and how do you address those? Yeah, we have tremendous numbers of security issues in public cloud. So, so if we are saying, uh, for example, Mars public outreach websites, all of that data, all that information is publicly released, mm -hmm. right? So yeah, that's the right place to put it is something that has you know, very little governance or security or compliance around it. So we stuck that in Amazon public. But when you're talking about security for, uh, let's say, you know, uh, community clouds like GovCloud, we have a, a serious amount of, of, what we've really done is, um, and, and this is not an Amazon talk, but um, we either use OpenStack because it's on-prem, so we have all of our, our, our security measures. But if we go out to a public cloud, we'll extend our VP, uh, we'll extend our IT security controls, our intrusion detection, our packet captures by creating a VPC and extending a VPN to that region, whatever that region may be, it would be at Azure and Amazon. And, and by doing that, we're doing two things, right? We're, encrypt, we're encrypting in, in transit via IPsec, right? And then while we're there, uh, because all of our controls are there, it's like a node on our network. We can, we can watch it. We can, we can, we can know what, what's been done. We can, we can syslog it. We can do a lot of things like that. So the real key to, to, to securing a, a kind of community cloud for us is extending it via IPsec. And also the reason for doing that is then the users still have the flexibility of all, of all those cloud capabilities without, let's say, us telling them, hey, you must encrypt all your data at rest, right? Because once you do that, then a lot of the services you'd find in the cloud are, are not as accessible because you've got this overhead of encrypting everything right, at rest. Mm -hmm. So our, our trick really has been extending our VPN tunnels directly into a, a cloud provider. Uh, so one more quick question. Please. So. So when, when you do these uh, VPCs, are they from your on-premise OpenStack to Amazon and yeah, so separately right on-premise uh, OpenStack to Azure? Or, or you have Amazon and Azure also integrated in the same VPC? Yeah, yeah so, so, so right, now, right now, our OpenStack instances can talk to our Amazon instances, right, because they're on the same network. Yeah. We're routing all that traffic because it's all behind our firewall. Mm -hmm. right. But but also between Amazon instances and Azure services, not yeah. between Amazon and Azure today. Okay. Right. Just 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 it's a it's a matter of us not uh, having a huge footprint in Azure. But but we're working with well these guys are recoding uh, their their interface to to match the new uh, Microsoft Azure APIs so that we'll have that capability using using a uh, scaler. So the, so you're planning to integrate Amazon instances with Azure services. We kind of do that today, right? So I, I can give you an example. Um, we have a we have an internal YouTube. We call it JPL Tube, right? So it's 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 a it's a great resource to upload things like training videos and, and various things like that. And and we, we we actually use it for a very scientific pur purpose, which is we 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 take videos that we've shot of you know uh, and and images that we shot of um, um, you know spacecraft assembly, right? So we also have to be 504 compliant. So we actually leverage Amazon uh, to, to host the, and OpenStack to, to host the JPL2 storage and servers. But there's a service in Azure called um, uh, Azure Media Services. One, it's, it, it, essentially, it's an, we, we, we stick an audio file in Azure storage. It does the transcription and indexing of that audio file. And we take that audio file back, and we take that index back. Right? And we stick it back into our, our private cloud. So now you have a, a searchable, indexable, transcription 
of the entire video file so that you know, people who are, who, are, who are hearing impaired can actually read the exact. Um, so, so we are using like a strange hybrid approach to multi-clouds already. We've been doing that. And it doesn't really require connectivity between one cloud to another. We're just sticking an audio file in, in media servers, bringing it back, sticking that transcription into our, our JPL tube. So okay. we're completely 504 compliant. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I wonder if you could elaborate on your choice of salt stack. Uh, I'm just curious if you compared it with other things out there and yeah, what we, works we do and what use, doesn't. We use Chef, we use Puppet. For us, um, it, it was a cultural thing. Our systems administrators are not strong in Ruby or Python. Right? They're, they're kind of essays, they're, they're, they're Linux guys. Um, so to get started, we, we liked, I mean, and we also like Ansible, but we like the fact that Salt had uh, this, it's based on YAML. It's, it, you don't have to be, you know, uh, it's not a programming language, it's markup language. It's kind of quicker to get them going, because we need them to write the, 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 the scripts for us. We need them to write the configurations. They, in the end, are supporting all those instances that are running. They have to ensure that they're secure. So for us, it was, it was that, that startup. You know, how quickly can we accelerate to do this, right? Because here we are launching lots of cloud instances, and if they're not secure, if they're not, if they're not given protective measures, we have a real problem, right? Um, the other thing is what we, what we like about SaltStack now is the SaltStack talk. And everybody should line up, all the vendors, and let's give everybody a high five. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, um, the, the, there's a concept of a, a, a master and a delegate master. Right, so IT security, our cybersecurity team can, can maintain the, 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 the main master, right? With protective measures, with, with patches, with everything like that. And all your delegate masters will inherit all those things, but they still can leverage, if you're a developer, leverage the delegate master to do all your automation. Maybe, you know, add libraries, uh, stick configurations in, various things like that. So we like that concept as well. We have a main master that cybersecurity manages, and we give delegate masters to other service providers or, or developers so that they can use it to um, uh, manage their instances. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody. All right.